The average person will live to be 90, 79 years old right now, and a person who lives 79 years will live through over 20, 29,000 days or 700,000 hours, which translates into about 41 million minutes. And yet I wonder how many of those 41 million minutes are minutes that are highly significant in terms of our lives. How many hours and how many days are really important in determining life direction? If you were to total up the times that really constitute the determining picture and factor of your life today, how many of those millions of minutes would it involve? In the flow of international events, how many issues of history have been determined in just a few minutes or a few hours or a few days of activity? It is said that the whole Civil War pivoted on a few hours before Gettysburg actually took place, and those few moments determine the shape of our nation today. Some of you, I would say, and I'm not going to ask for hands, are old enough to remember December 7, 1941. Some of you are old enough to remember John F. Kennedy in November of 1963. How many of you remember the Challenger when it blew up? Can you see it in your eyes? Some of you are old enough to really remember that. Did you know that that took place on January 28, 1986. It happened in 75 seconds. How many of you can see in your mind September 11, 2001, where you were, what was on TV, what did you see? You see, if you close your eyes, there are times in our lives that we can see, you know, I can close my eyes and I can still see the smoke of the pieces of the challenger, a moment in time that is imprinted on our lives forever. Some of us remember the death of John F. Kennedy. Some of us remember 2001 September, a moment in time. This is true of all our human existence, actually, what is imprinted as a single moment in your mind. That car accident, that special loved one who died, and you remember what it did to you and does to you and still does to you, the pain that, and the sorrow. There are moments that we all remember in terms of our lives that touch our heart. They are a part of our our memories for the rest of our lives, and when we close our eyes, we can see a lot of those. The person who is scarred for life by an abusive parent, or a word unfitly spoken, those moments and times when we are somehow crippled or made less of a person, a word that goes into our heart, to the very heart of our being. Significant moments in times. They are not all painful either or sorrowful. I remember that first kiss. It was very important to me. I still remember it. It was exhilarating. Sorry, Bert, it wasn't you. <laughs> Her name was Barbara Landholt, and we were in the eighth grade. It was in front of the local soda shop, and I remember that day. This, wow. I also remember the day that I met Jesus for the first time in my own bedroom. I remember the day that I was ordained. I remember the day that I met Berta. <laughs> she, she made the cut. <laughs> Our fraternity was having an exchange with her sorority, and it, for those of you who can remember, it was a soupy sales exchange, and she got hit with a pie in her face. There are moments that are embedded in, on the pages of my pictorial history, significant moments in history. The uh, seemingly casual meeting, which became a most memorable moment. The decision in private in your own heart, you remember. 
Perhaps you were shaving or taking a shower or driving a car someplace, or you were washing the dishes and it just came to you. The decision was made in your mind, and it changed your life forever. Eternally significant moments. When a decision is made that governs the course of so much of your life. I suppose that life, if it has 41 million minutes in it, may also have its significant issues decided in maybe a couple hundred minutes, actually. Sometimes as little as three or four minutes. For some, maybe it's just a few seconds. For some of you, it may have been at a great banquet in three days. You know, we have a lot to our lives, and our lives can be very fulfilling, but life is determined in small moments, and so it is history. All of human history is, too. It shouldn't surprise us when we look at our own lives that we are shaped by very small moments of the larger whole, and it shouldn't surprise us that the universal history of God deals with humanity should be determined on the basis of really a very few moments in history. Tonight we're going to look at three moments in history. They are eternally significant moments because they show us God's redemptive action in history through Jesus. They are historically important as well because everywhere on this planet, people acknowledge these three moments. These three moments in time are Christmas, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. But before we look at that, we need to understand a couple of things about time. In the Greek language, there are two words for time. One has to do with the passage of time, like when you're sitting here. The other word, that word is chronos, and it has to do with chronology. And you have a, I have a chronometer on my wrist right now. That's a fancy word for a watch, and it deals with the passage of time. The other word in the Greek language is the word kairos, and it's the word for the right time, or the opportune time, or the perfect time, or that eternal time. And these two words are used in Greek for time. The one has to do with the passage of time, chronos, and one has to do with describing the right time, kairos the opportune time. How many times have we, be, we have observed someone will say just the right thing at the right moment and do the right thing or just at just the right time? Something that is arranged in perfect order that says, oh God, it's beautiful. And what you're observing then is kairos, the right time. And Scripture says that God sent his Son in the chronos of human history to accomplish for us a kairos, a perfect and acceptable time, and it is in these times that we recognize God's presence. God's timing is recognized in the events of our lives. Three moments in time. The first one is Christmas. This is why we're here tonight. The birth of Jesus. Everybody acknowledges Christmas, whether they believe it or not. It divides our calendars, B.C., A.D. No question about the birth of that baby. That baby in Bethlehem was born, and suddenly in one moment of time, God impacted the entire planet, and the whole planet observes it. Whether it is in faith or not is really immaterial. That moment in time has impacted the history of this world. Read with me Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. There we go. In that region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. 
you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a remainder. Remember the shepherds on the hillside, probably passing a bottle of wine around the campfire, trying to keep warm late at night, and suddenly, in one moment, the skies open up, and they are overwhelmed by the heavenly host singing a song, To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And one of the shepherds has the presence of mind to say, Hide the bottle! These are shepherds, folks. They're hard hat, redneck guys like our cowboys. They're out there fending off rustlers and animals. They're real people. They're real men. They're not nincompoops that have nothing else to do. Suddenly the sky opens up, and here they are, and they get overwhelmed by it. They didn't invent it. You don't get together as a group and invent stuff like that. One guy says, hey, look, angels. And the other guy says, yeah, oh, come on. What are you, are you drunk? Did you drink too much of that stuff? And then he sees them himself, and they all saw them. The angel said to you today is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I don't know about you, but I need a Savior. I need the hope that comes up with a Savior, the knowledge that God is giving me someone to meet me where I am, and it's not that I am some kind of a wimp wandering around in life without a road map. It has to do with me coming to terms with my deepest needs, and you too. Every one of us needs a Savior. To you is born this day a Savior. One moment in time. And what makes moments like this significant is that it applies to all time. The birth of Jesus is a moment in time that doesn't just have an historic moment in the past. It works right now. That's an interesting fact, but it's why you are here tonight, by the way. Christmas is still working in you. It is in these eternally significant moments that things are not only historically established, but they carry on. Even those who fail fall away from the Lord Jesus in their heart someplace in a moment of time when they heard the angels sing, To you is born this day a Savior. Read with me John chapter 19, verses 8, 28 to 30. Here we go. After this, Jesus, knowing that was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl of vinegar of stood there, and so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Glad this isn't vinegar. The second of the three moments in time is at the cross when Jesus was crucified. It's also why we're here tonight. There is no place on this planet that people don't at least understand that the cross is a sign of rescue and mercy. People wear crosses whether they know anything about Jesus or not. Some just wear them as a fashion statement, but not a faith statement. And even if they mock or hate him, some will still wear that cross. And the reason is that at one moment in time, a man who was God in the flesh was stretched forth on a cross, the same one that was born in a manger, why we're here tonight, in another significant moment. He said that he was dying for the sins of the world. He cried out in one moment in time, it is finished. And in that moment, he provided the full provision of forgiveness for everybody's sin. Jesus cried out, he said, It is finished for anything that traps, that stains, or destroys, or obstructs your experience or mine. And those things are numberless. And we call these things dying moments. We call these things obstacles in our lives. They, we call these things sin. Those times when we experience death in our lives. And Jesus dying on the cross was the dying moment of Father God whose son was born on that night when the shepherds heard the heavenly host. He died for our sin, and that sin does, doesn't have to do with a lot of stuff. Sin doesn't have anything to do with religion. Sin has to do with what wrings the joy out of life. 
And boy, don't we sin against one another all the time. And I expect there are families here tonight and there is sin that you have with one another and you will not forgive one another. And so the hopes and fears of all the years come together. And sin has to do with what creeps in and grabs us on the inside and makes us less than what we ought to be. Sin is what makes us selfish and hateful and ugly towards others. Sin is what in significant moments in our lives we turn to God with the things that tie us up and kill us and destroy us, which we can't seem to get free of ourselves. In one eternal moment in time when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, it is finished and died for you and freed you and me from sin and the things that hold us in prison, in guilt that happened a long time ago. How many things do we labor with where we are at fault and we have sinned and we have destroyed someone or ourselves or part of our family and we carry it with us and Jesus comes and says, I want to put a finish to that sin right now and take it away. I don't know what might be holding you tonight. What kind of sin that you have in your life or guilt or obstacle to God's grace that is in your way. There may be something dead inside of you and you need to get rid of it. Some point of past bondage that has crippled you and has shackled you. But Jesus said 2,000 years ago in one eternal significant moment in time, it is finished. We are done with it. I take it to myself. And just as Jesus is hanging there, he comes to us in the present moment here tonight when we celebrate his birth. And he is finishing the hold of that evil or sin on someone here tonight. And he will bring new freedom to you. Now, I'm going to say this to you. If you have something that needs to be offered up to Jesus tonight on the cross where he can say it is finished to you, it's this moment in time, like out of all these million moments of times in our lives that we have when we can enter into that new relationship with him and we can breathe new life into us through him. Maybe this night is your moment in time. The third moment in time is the resurrection. A few months from now, people will sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. One moment in time when an earthquake shook the earth and the stone rolled away and it was an uh, angel who said, he is not here, he is risen. We are dealing with superstition when we think that this did not happen. Read with me Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 9. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. This moment in time of the resurrection is surrounded by people who have faced just as tough stuff in life as some of us. And they were just as inclined toward hard-nosed cynicism and unbelief as you and I can be, and they were persuaded. They didn't lay their lives down for a hoax. They didn't invent an idea and then live their life as a, at great expense of suffering to establish the early message of the gospel because it was just a nice idea that they thought they could peddle. The resurrection is reality. Jesus literally physically rose from the dead in one eternally significant moment. All of history was changed. 
two disciples on the road to Emmaus discovered that it was in this one moment in time of their lives that they were turned from a dead situation into eternal life. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman. Read with me Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. One in the fullness of time, one moment in time, God had this planned. In the full flower of the moment, there is the rising of the dead. Now, there is truth here. First, it verifies that he is who he said he was. His resurrection sets him apart from every other religious leader in history, from every other human being in history. Nobody ever lived like Jesus. Nobody ever performed miracles like Jesus. Nobody ever taught like Jesus. Nobody died like Jesus. But all those things, as unique as they are, mean nothing without the resurrection. Nobody even comes close to the resurrection. There have been great teachers and people who have died nobly, and usually things happen to them and around them, but only one person rose from the dead, he is the Lord. His name is Jesus. I want you to say Jesus is Lord with me. Jesus is Lord. It was a moment like this that he came forth from the tomb. It was a moment like this that he appeared to Mary Magdalene, to Peter by the Sea of Galilee, to Thomas, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. In John chapter 20, verse 22, it says that, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed. And then he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. We are here tonight to celebrate the birth of Jesus one moment in time. But we are here because he died on the cross in one moment of time, but he rose from the dead. Today, may you experience that eternal moment because this is really the recognition of Christ as the light of the world. Three moments in time that have made all the difference in our world, in your world, my world. Let's pray. Lord, for the many things that you give to us, we give thanks. But especially for these three moments in time, the one which we come to tonight to celebrate your birth into the world, that you became flesh and dwelt among us. For these things we give thanks in Jesus' name.